Okay. All right, guys, I'm recording right now. Mm. So the plan, obviously, you know, if you look at the menu, we have you know, so many things to cover. I'm actually looking at my board right now. I'm actually looking at my board right now. And when I look at this board, we have, we cover Linux fundamentals. We did a little bit more than the fundamentals, but we did. Um, we covered Git, we had AWS fundamentals. And guys, when we say fundamentals, these topics we're doing right now, what I'm giving you is a big, you know, the biggest exposure and understanding you can have. And then you can start building off of that. For example, what we're doing for AWS is AWS fundamentals. Usually you go to a whole class and pay maybe two to 3,000 just for AWS, like a cloud architect, because there's so many things. Um, Linux usually is a completely different class. So everything we're doing here, we're basically taking different classes and doing them all in one. So don't expect that the depth will be 100%. But as you see all these links that you see in the slides, these links are meant for you to read more and practice more. And if you have questions, you can ask me because it's, there's so many things uh, that we we'll we'll have to cover to be a DevOps engineer. Um, that, I have a question real quick. Yeah. Um, so I haven't checked the last class. So do, um, um, so is it compulsory for me to go back and see the video and then also see this video and then move on to the next one? Bro, it's a continuation, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not like so anything is building off of the other, but there's always going to be links. Now, what we're doing today is not going to build, it's not going to be like a chain to say that you have to know this to know this. But okay. the people that started was the last video and attended the last class, they already have a better understanding of how AWS works, right? How to create, how to SSH, which Bajo was doing today. Those are some skills that once you, you've done those, you know, every other, to understand those other things becomes easier, right? But now you're just jumping into it. You're still gonna understand, but you know, obviously it's a big difference. Between yeah, I was just, I was just gonna like, you know, seek for your, um, just gonna make a suggestion that maybe I should just, you know, instead of me looking into this, I should just go back to that video and watch it and then get this video after you're done with the class and then, However, okay. however I want to do it, it's up to you, bro. It's up to you. There's two things I'm concerned about for me personally only. One is if you're not, you know, coming to class, you're watching the videos. And two, in fact, there's three things. Two, you're not just watching the videos, you're practicing. And three, when the time comes, you know, people, you know, make their payments. Those are the three things, right? Because one, I'm not going, I'm not trying to waste my time. I obviously want people to learn. So all those three things, they, they tie into your commitment, obviously. Oh, yeah. now I keep telling people, yeah, they tie all into your commitment. Whether you're watching the videos, whether you're watch, doing the homeworks, or if you're paying, it's all basically the same mindset. The guy that doesn't watch the videos, who doesn't study hard, will likely not pay pretty much. You know, and some people pay and they don't attend the class, but you know, that's not sustainable, but that's what I'm saying. You know, this thing is no joke, man. This thing, DevOps is no joke. You don't get paid 160000 or nothing. You have to not just study, but you have to practice and be disciplined, you know? You know, you know so that's, all, that's my only advice because I, I've seen a few things. If you want to make it to the end, I'll say it again. If you want to make it to the end, you have to watch the videos. You have to also go and practice, read the links, and come back and ask me questions. That's how you succeed. Um, Oh man, on, on a normal uh, 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 skill, I mean, you just don't watch video without practicing uh, when typing in something. So then just know what you would learn out of code. Like on a normal, like if you're learning coding, you have to like, you know, punch in something. Um, yeah, I get everything you said. I, you know, I was just trying to get your uh, intake in, uh, in what I just said, so. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm just saying. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a continuation. But unlike Linux or Git, we're not building off of the previous topic, right? Oh, okay. We're just doing AWS as a whole. Oh, okay. So th some things might tie in each other. The people who are with the last class are obviously picking some things faster, but 
it's not like a whole like you have to do this to do this. So it's up to you. If you want to watch the videos, uh, if you rather watch the other video and then watch this video, it's up to you, man. You know, this, you know, it's up to you. You make that decision. Okay. You know? So if you if you feel like you want to watch the video, uh, that's up to you. You know, I'm here for you know, you know, people who have questions, they can ask. You know, they can go along with me. But you know, if you just want to watch the videos, that's that's always a good option too. But you have to practice and you have to be consistent with the video. So you have to watch them for the next class. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, so anyways, we have RDS. I know we talked about RDS yesterday. Um, it's about the database, um, creating databases in the cloud. Um, I'm just review that real quick. So for AWS, we do have multiple database types that you can create, right? And everything we create on AWS, remember everything we create on AWS on the console, which means a click, click, click. You can also do it using two other forms. You can use it, you can do it with code, which could be Terraform or even Python. Or you can also do the same thing using what we call AWS CLI. So we'll talk about that next class. Next class, I think we're gonna try to install the CLI. Uh, what we're gonna do next class is we're gonna talk about EKS, ECS, some other Kubernetes Docker offerings. We might talk a little bit about the pipelines, the CIC pipeline. But after AWS, we're studying Jenkins. Which Jenkins is going to handle the pipeline? But it doesn't hurt for me to build a pipeline in AWS and show you how it works in AWS because Git Jenkins is a third party platform. So any company can have it. But with the tools on AWS, um, you have to have AWS to use them. So not all companies are using them. You get the point? So companies using Azure, GCP, and other cloud platforms, they can still use Jenkins, but they cannot use the, the custom um, tools that we have on AWS, like code commit, code build, and things like that. But I'll talk about them so you have an idea, because it's important. So for the databases, you know, creating a database, like I said, you can create from code, or you could create directly from your, from your console. Right here, so I could just simply go to my RDS here, and it's as easy as just creating a database. So RDS, you see, you can search RDS here in your main console, and RDS pops up, and then you can click on it, and it'll take you straight to the RDS page. And this is where you can create any database system that you want to create. You want to create Oracle, you want to create um, MySQL, you know, and other stuff. This is where you can create it. So if you had someone that was an Oracle database administrator, you're taking an Oracle class. But you don't have a custom database to practice with. You can come here, create a database um, here, and then with your database, you can create, see, you can choose Aurora, which is the same as MySQL, just like a managed version. You can create MySQL, MyDB, and this is Oracle. So whichever one you want, you choose, you know, you, you choose what version, there's so many versions. Version eight is the latest, as you can see. And then multi easy When you say multi easy this is very important, especially for your interview. When you're doing interviews, they're gonna ask you questions like, okay, you're creating a database. How do you make that database? What will happen if my database goes down, right? They're asking you something in the line of that question, that how can you build a database on AWS to make sure that when it goes down, you're not gonna lose your data, right? Everything is gonna be running still. They're always gonna ask you that question on interviews and it's high availability. That's what it is. And this is basically what this does, right? So you see single instance, means that you just have one system. So if it goes down, you might be in trouble. But now, what you're gonna tell that person in an interview is I want a multi AC, which means multi availability zones. So what's happening is they're gonna have your one main database that you created, let's say in US East one in Virginia. And then they're going to create something called a replica, right? In another region, but you're not controlling that. So this comes into effect because if your database in US Virginia East, one, your main database that your customer sells from. If it fails, automatically what the database does is automatically promotes your slave, which is another region to be the master, pretty much. So which means that your slave is now going to start serving read and write requests. When your slave was a replica, it was serving just read, 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 read requests. So you can read, but you can't change anything because it's copying from the main database. But when the main database goes down, now your availability zone, your, your system, you're not gonna do anything. AWS automatically do it. 
Once you take this option, multi AZ, when your database goes down, it will automatically promote the other database that used to be a, a standby, a replica, to a master, and then your system continues working like nothing happened. And then they're going to try to figure out what happened here, you know? So keep that in mind. That's a very important concept that they want to they know in the interview. Do you understand multi AZ, which is what is exactly here? If you notice that this option is now open for MySQL, but if you choose Aurora, you might have that option open. Let's see. Oh, you see, you see now that I have Aurora, I have a lot more options open, right? You know why? Because Aurora is, is managed by, it's like it's built by AWS pretty much. So it's their system. So they can do pretty much anything they want to do with it. So that's why you see all these many options. But this is the same as in MySQL. What you see here, Aurora, is the same as MySQL. Because AWS has changed everything, they're managing it full flesh. Now they change the name to Aurora. But if you can work on MySQL, you can work on Aurora. So these are the database systems that you can create, you know. And then let me see if there's any important options that you, you can choose. multi AZ, you see, even, 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 even Postgres has this multi AZ DB cluster. So instead of having one system in US East Virginia and another one in US East 2. Now you have a cluster. You can have a cluster. So I can say I want two instances in US East 1 and two standby in US East B. So instead of having one of each, you're having a cluster of multiple databases. You know, so that, that, that's, a, that's a, but it'll cost you money. Not a lot of money though, but it's definitely what, so keep that in mind. multi AZ is for high availability. So you can never lose data. So guys, so I know you've heard about database administrators and stuff, right? So as a DBA, this would technically be one of your job. I used to build for MySQL, but when I used to do database, I used to build a real replica for MySQL. So you basically you know, go through some process called binary logs and you build a new system that is going to be replicated from the main MySQL. So that's what basically what I was doing here, but I have to do it and it's hard to manage. And it can be difficult. So now they're already doing it for you. So as a DBA, if you can set up replication, they're looking at you like a high class DBA, man. But now AWS is already doing it for you. So that's why I keep telling you, man, database administrators, you know, that's why the jobs are gonna keep shrinking. Because imagine now that uh, things that I used to do and really call myself a big database administrator. Now you can find them in the cloud. That's why the cloud is so important. So you see VP connectivity. We'll talk about VPCs let, um, a little bit more later. But this is essentially which VPC you want your database to run in. And it's important where your VPC is because if I want my systems to work with my database, I want to run my systems in the same VPC as my database. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then security group, we've talked about security group. It's like a virtual firewall for instances. And then your password authentication. So some of these are not very important, but the main ones we covered is multi AZ. This is important for interviews. It's high availability, it's very important. Uh, these are the settings, username, password. This is what you use to log into a database. So these are just basic authentication. Instance class. So this is like, remember we talked yesterday about data instant types for AWS. So choosing like, oh, I want two CPU and five gigabytes of RAM. I want three CPU. And so this is basically what it is on the database level. So you can choose which instance you want. Do I want eight CPU, 32 gigabytes of RAM? So this is where you choose how big, basically you want your database server to be, to be, how powerful it is, how many CPU and RAM, this is where you choose. And the storage, storage type, you know, obviously, you know, there's a general purpose SSD, and then there's a provision. I, so this one is good for high throughput. So if you have a lot of reads to your database, you know, you want to choose provision, but if you want a general database, or just a normal instance, you use general purpose. But for databases, just really use the default, this is a provision I have. So most of the default options are usually the better options. But then when you need changes, now you can come and look at the other options. So anyway, that's it. And you create a database and you can connect to it. You know, if we have time today, I'll just create the database real quick. And if we have time today, we can, you know, I'll connect to it. But you know, it's the same thing as a DevOps engineer. You know, you probably will never connect to it. You know, I can't remember the last time I connected to a database. You know, that was like what, like eight months ago. So, but I'll build them, I'll deploy them, I'll make sure they're running, I'll make sure the applications can connect to it at a high level. But you as a DevOps, you're not managing those databases in like on a granular level. 
you're looking at it from the top pretty much. So, so creating it, you know, this is where I create a database. So I'll just create a database for free. I'll put give a name. Let's see. No, uh, I didn't give a password. So I'll just put the password on me. So this password you see here, if you are, let's say if a DBA or anybody came to you and said, we need a new database, we need you to create a database for us. When you finish creating that database, you have to use this admin password to go into the database and create users for them. But then if you trust them, the administrators, you can give them this access and then they'll be able to access the password pretty much. Sorry, the database pretty much. They wanna be careful with that. So database is creating, so we're just gonna proceed. Uh, let's see. Anyway, that's RDS, that's databases. And we talked about last class, if you didn't watch, databases are so important. There's no system running without the database. You can't see any system running without database. Walmart.com, you know, Copa, you know, Copa even has even a bigger database. I know last time I checked Copa, they were using my score, you know, and they were looking for database administrators. So they have a huge database. So Keep this in mind, every system, every company, every, you see they have a database. You can't survive without a database. Because that's where your applications cannot store data. Your applications cannot store data. You need a database in the back end that will store data, retrieve data, make changes. So this is something that, you, that's an important concept that you have to just at least understand. So, you know, it'd be nice to read more, but, you know, databases for storing data. So I know we would, we're supposed to talk about user management or what we call IM. So this is a very important concept in AWS because you have to know how to manage users. Me as a data, as a DevOps engineer, I tend to manage users sometimes, right? I don't like doing it. It's not a fun part of the job, but it's important because you know you have the keys as a DBA. So you have to know who accesses your AWS cluster, right? Who, who does what and what? So this is where you manage access to everything to resources, to people, to groups. And this is this is, this is is where you do it at IAM. So as you can see here, you can have fine-grained access control with IAM, which means that you can create users in IAM. You can create resources, resource, um, what do you call it? resource permissions. When I say resources, I mean like an EC2, an S3 bucket, those are resources. So you can create permissions for those resources. And then least privileged permission. So as an engineer, keep this in mind. You want to work with the policy of least privilege. So, I mean, least privilege is exactly what you know, it is. You want to make sure that I am giving the minimum access to perform an activity to a person. So if someone says, oh, can I get access to AWS? You have to ask them that, what do you want to do with AWS? What's your daily job? If he says, oh, I, I'm, I'm a database guy, I wanna work with the databases. Then you create this account and only give him access to databases. Don't give him access to EC2s. Don't give him access to clusters and things like that. You only give him access to database. And if he says, oh, I only need access to four or five particular databases. You can give him access to only those five databases. So that's least privilege. So you're giving someone only the permission they need to perform their job, nothing more. Because people, when you give them permission, if someone goes in there and see that they can be able to do more things than they're supposed to, they'll go around and start clicking and they might mess up things, they might cause vulnerabilities. So least privilege, keep in mind, if someone is asking you questions in an interview about, you know, how do you do user management, right? How do you use, are you used to managing users and how do you do that? The first thing you want to mention is least privilege. So you go by the policy of least privilege. Once you say that in an interview, they know you know what you're saying. You know, then they, 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 they're just gonna go ahead. And then we have this that I had here, it's called Federated OIDC. So let me explain this concept um, in a better way, because you know, the videos I watch, you know, the people I've attended, they've really never given a good example of what a federated user is. You know, when you log into a website and they'll tell you a website you've never logged in before, and they'll tell you that you can sign up with your, with your Google account. Yeah. Have you ever wondered how, you know, just by using your Google account, they can be able to give you access without you signing up and then you can be able to do what you need to do? 
This is the guy right here, the federated OIDC. So essentially, so right now, you know, the concepts are important. Now we can do all the practicals you want, but if you understand the concepts, trust me, you could, you could, you could mostly, you could scratch a lot of interviews, a lot of questions in interviews, even before we get to the concept. So with the federated OIDC, what happens is, it gives you something we call a temporary access, right? Each time you go to a website and they're not even asking you to, 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 to create an account or anything, they just telling you you can sign up with your Gmail and stuff like that. What you're doing is once you sign up with your Gmail, it takes your Gmail and goes through the AWS system and using the federated OIDC, it uses now your Gmail as, it uses your Gmail automatically as an account because Gmail is obviously an account, even though it's owned by Gmail, and use the different web service. But Gmail is already, they already have Gmail servers that can authenticate with AWS. So what happens is once you submit your account, they take it and they automatically create something we call a hash, which is a temporary access to you, right? And then whatever you need to do as a user, they're going to automatically create some rules for you that that user can assume and use. And you're gonna do whatever you need to do. And when you sign up, guess what? When you sign up, everything gets deleted. And then when you come back and sign, log in again with your Gmail, it gets created automatically from scratch. So, so yeah, so you see that in IAM. So that's exactly what happens. So we call that YDC. I've never seen it asked in many interviews, but when you start working as a, as a DevOps, you know, those are things I want to keep in mind when you're creating systems, clusters. Now you can also give people access. I can give Bajo access to my AWS account without really creating a user for, for, for Bajo by using federated YDC. He'll be able to access my system for as long as I want him to without having a user base in there, just temporary user and password. So this is a rundown. I try to use visualizations as much as I can because they're easier than, than you know, many ways that you could use to probably explain. So as you see here, this is what the typical structure, you want your typical structure to be, right? You have your account and then you always want to create groups. That's how you start doing user access management. So you want to create groups. So if there's developers on my team, I want to create a group called developers like you see here. I'll create a group called tests. So the team that does testing. And then I create a group called admins. This is for the big guys, you know, the DevOps engineer it's in the team and stuff like that. When you create these groups, now you go in there and you can, in those groups, you can give them the permissions that they need. So for, for, for admin, I'll give them every permission that they could use because they're administrators, right? For developers, I only give them developer-based permission. So what is gonna enable them to do their jobs as a developer? And then for testing, I only give them access to what they need to do their testing. So this is how you control access as a DevOps engineer. And when and the companies you work for, I can guarantee you, you, you will most likely be, have the admin access and you'll be allowed to give people access, retrieve access and things like that. So this is going to be a bread and butter. So just keep in mind, least privilege, make sure you use groups for different users. So now this makes it easier for you. You're gonna see, but when I create a user called Nate, instead of going in there and giving Nate all kinds of permission, I just add Nate to the developer group and he already has all the developer permissions, right? Isn't that easy? You know, when I create Katie, if Katie is a test, I just add Katie to the test group. If, I, if a new engineer, DevOps engineer joins, I just add him to the admin group, it makes my life easy. So the permissions some look something like this. This is just, I'm gonna open some in real time. But I talked about this yesterday, you're always gonna have your version. The version stays the same, it's always 2012, 10, 17, because it's the most recent API for some reason. Um, the OWS definitely needs to update this. So if they do update their coding and the API language, if they do update it, and then they're gonna have to update the version too here. So, they, so this just tells you that they haven't updated since 2012. So whatever we're using now is the API since 2012. They're just adding new things to it, you know? So you will always see like a statement, you know, your SID, you know, is always gonna be your way to describe that role. Your effect is gonna be either allow or deny. If I put deny, it means that any action that I put here, for example, this one is to assume role with a web identity. If this was denied, it means that whoever principal that is here, right? Whoever is a principal, which is at this case is a cognito, you know, identity, it's a service. They're not going to be able to assume role. But now that is allowed, so allow and deny the opposite. 
So if I wanted to give roles, certain roles to people, it's going to be allowed and it's going to have the actions, it's going to be the roles. You see that in real life. If I wanted to deny access, I'm going to just put deny here and then put whatever role I don't want this person to have, pretty much. That's essentially what it is, you know? Same as this one below. This one's a bucket policy created for S3. You see the action is I'm giving the um, users access to list a bucket. So you can go in there and read the bucket pretty much. And then the, the resource, resource part of it is, is telling them who or what has that access. So with this resource, I can put an account name. Like Vitaly, if I had created an account in my account, I could put your AR in here. So you'll be the only one that has access to this bucket. If I put a star here, like an asterisk, it means that everybody, keep that in mind, everybody. I'm taking this because it's very easy to understand, but a, a chain, a row is basically a chain of all this with multiple rows in them, but this is like the most basic one, so it's easy to understand. Uh, you wouldn't have to do this. Now, AWS has made things easy. You know, now you can generate rows depending on what you're doing. So everything is not as complicated. Before I used to write this, so I'll do research and create this JSON and I'll have a lot of errors. But now you don't have to do all that, man. I think life is easy. So let's go in into IAM because it's an important concept. It's not super big, but it's super important. So I'm, I'm going there real quick. What am I even saying is not super big? What I, when I say it's not super big, I mean the learning curve is not super crazy. You can get by by knowing just the basics of IAM. You know, but there's more to it, but the basics is enough for you to get going. So now this is my account. This is my IAM account. So as you can see here, it's very straightforward. So these are the different groups. As you can see, I already have a group here called admin. Now I can create another group called developers. You know, this group would be for developers. And then in my developer group, I wanna add users to it, right? I, I can add users to it right now, but I can do it later. So I'm not going to add users to it. This is my user, the user I'm currently on using right now. So now that I created the group, now when you come down in the group, you can choose which rights you wanna to give to that group, right? So there's so many of them, you can tell it goes all the way to page 37. So the best way to look at the specific roles for your user. So let me put it this way. Let me, let me put it this way. Each thing you see here, right? Let me open that in big. Each thing you see here is a, called a policy, right? So anything you see here is a policy. So a group will be a, mix, a mixture of many different policies, right? And each policy is gonna to pertain to a particular resource. Does that make sense? And when I say resource, I mean S3, I mean EC2, I mean RDS or database, you know, I mean load balancers, I mean VPCs, I mean CloudWatch, you know, anything on AWS that you can control as a resource. So again, you have policies in here and each policy, it pertains to a resource. So let's just say, for example, EC2. If I click EC2 here and enter, you can see all kinds of policies pertaining to EC2. All right, let's say I want, I want my developers to have full access to EC2. I'm going to you know, add this to that group, right? I add EC2. Let's say I wanted to give my developers need to access database. I'll search RDS. I'll search or, or RDS, oh, there's too many. Yeah, I'll search RDS, right? And you can see there's different roles for RDS, but now I only want my developers to be able to read from the database. I don't want to give them full access. So you can read but you can't do anything else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for read access here. Read only, you see? Read only access. So I only want them to be able to read from my database. I don't want them to be able to make any changes. Okay, so let's see. Let's just look for one more row because it's just a demo. Normally a developer, they'll have many uses. You know, they want to access EC2, they want to access, you know, certain things. But let me just add one more. Obviously developers, let's say they want to access logs, right? They want to be able to look at CloudWatch logs. I'm going to talk, talk about CloudWatch in a bit. So I'll come here and I'll search for CloudWatch. You see, we have multiple CloudWatch. And keep in mind that you can create your own roles based off of this. So if you understood how you know, the permissions work, you can create your own roles, custom roles. But you, know, you already have most of the roles that you need here. So I want my developers to be able to access CloudWatch on EC2. In fact, I want to give them the full CloudWatch 
uh, role. So let's see which one. Yeah, Star Wars full access. Um, I want to give them. So I'm going to create my group. And remember, I created the developers group, guys. And my developers group, I added them to, I gave them three different um, full accesses. I gave them access to EC2, I gave them access to CloudWatch, and I also gave them access to the database. All right, so we have our developer group. Let's say you had another group um, called um, Testers. We had another group called Data Analytics Team. You're gonna have all kinds of teams. We have an analytics team. You can create a separate group for the analytics team. And now we look at the permissions and you see the three permissions that I added. Let's go to the EC2. You see what it looks like? When I open it, you see the version always stays the same, right? It's always 2012, 10, 17. The statement, I want action, all action on EC2, effect, allow. If I put deny here, Automatically, what I'm doing is I'm reversing this, this permission. I'm telling them that I don't want them to have any access to any EC2 instance. You see, effect allow. It's so easy. Elastic banks, it looks complicated, but everything is done for you by AWS. If I copy, I can copy this and modify it and create my own role if I wanted to. Or you can just copy this and paste it in your own simulator, your own role, and you create the same role for you. So you can always copy, mix and match. Everything is there. If you see, for example, you're looking for something about around EC2, but you don't want the full access. You can come here and look for what you need, copy it and add to another policy, just like that. You can copy and paste. But the essential thing you have to know is everything is already there. So did they have EC2 full access? No, they have CloudWatch and all that stuff. So now to create a user, this is how you do it. So uh, I know someone was asking me a question. Boris is not here because his son is sick. But Bajo and everyone else that have an AWS account or a mesh, you want, what you want to do is, you don't want to be using your email, right? The same account that you used to create an AWS account because the AWS account is essentially a company. When you go and work for a company, this is what you're going to see, the same AWS account that you have. So now what I, what I want you to do, you know, anybody watching this video, when you go at home and you're watching this video, what I want you to do is I want you to add a user, create a user. You're going to put your username. And this is a user that I will recommend that you use from now on. So I'm just going to put a name. It could be Linux, any name. You know, you want programmatic access and password, you know, using, and then you're going to create your custom password, right? Whatever password you want. I'm going to use the same password as well. Uh, with my previous account. You access, programmatic access key. We're going to talk about that next class. It can make things a little bit. You know, but this is better to talk about at the end of the last day of class. So if Saturday is going to be our last class, I'll talk about programmatic access then, because this is what you're going to use to be able to do things from the command line with AWS. So we'll talk about that, don't worry about that now. But if you create an access, you go next permissions. So this is what happens. Let's say you had a new developer join your team and they, you know, they created a ticket for you to create that developer access. Once you create a developer, you know, once you, you do this, let me go back to previous. Once you put the developer's username, you know, you, you see you can create multiple users at once. But once you do all this and then you hit next, now you can just say, okay, instead of me going there and creating and adding them, copy permissions, attaching policies, I can just add them to this developer group, right? And that's it. Now he is gonna inherit all the, the, these policies that we added to that developer group. So that's how you start managing user access. So I'm just gonna add them to this developer group. Uh, next tab, and then that's it. And they just create a user. So when I create my user, you're going to notice that they created this. It's going to create this. You know, what I want you to do is, if you create this, just download it to your machine, and then just make sure you have it. So make sure you download this CSV because we're going to need this access key and our secret access key when we start working with AWS via the API. We're going to do this at the end of the last day of class. And then we're also going to need this a lot when we're using Terraform, when we're using code. So just keep that in mind. So you can send it by email if you wanted. But yeah, I'm going to delete that user. But that's how you create a user. And then now, when you, once you create a user, right, if you, now you'll be able to follow this link and then log in as that same user. So if you create a user for yourself, add that user to your admin group and then start using that user instead of using your main account. So that's the best way to do it. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> yes i'm doing as you're talking i was trying to do the same thing okay i created the 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 account and then he told me to create a group i created uh, created a group admin group and he told me to add the account to the group so i added the account to the admin group now he's telling me next he says tax yeah i just hit next you could add tax if you want you don't have to okay uh add tax okay i just I don't have to, right? Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, that's it. So that's not, that's the basics of I am. And obviously you can see that there's so many things involved in it. There's so many roles that you could be dealing with. And you know, there's identity providers, as you can see here, you know? So this is for single sign-on and things like that. So, you know, you really, really wouldn't, you can go learn this if you want. But from my experience, I've really never had to use this uh, at my jobs. And you see, there's so many different settings that you could put, but you know what? Mm -hmm. you, yeah. I have a question. Yeah, I successfully created the 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 uh, the user the the username and the group. Okay, the CSV. Do I need to download that? Yeah, if you want to have programmatic access, you should. Are we gonna need it? For the class? Not this class, but you're gonna need it for the last day of class. I mean, we can always, you can always create a new user really quickly. So I'm not really worried okay. too much about that. Okay, okay. So yeah, right. so yeah, so class, you know, like I said, just keep in mind, every every policy, every role, or every group, is, is every user group is a bunch of policies put together, right? And then this is another important concept, that we need to talk about. So, so another thing you want to keep in mind, you want to understand here is roles. So essentially, role is is you know, how can I even explain this? So this is this is the best Spanish I can give you for roles. So, if I wanted to do something, let's say I wanted to run an EC2 instance, right? And that EC2 instance also had to do, let's say, some other you know permutations. Let's just say you have two systems that have to communicate with each other. You know that system, that system or that resource it needs to have the correct role to be able to perform what it needs to perform. You know, I'm gonna say I'm gonna explain it again in a different way. If you have anything that runs on AWS, you need a role to be able to run. So what I'm saying is, you cannot come into AWS and create and create a lambda function and let it run if the Lambda function doesn't have the right role to run. So that affects every system in here. Take for example, Bajo. I know you created an EC2 instance. That EC2 instance, for it to be able to communicate with the database, it needs the role. It needs role, the right role. It needs to have a role that says, you can be able to access databases with this database, otherwise you won't have access. So this is how Amazon controls different resources and different access to make sure that the wrong system is not connected to the wrong you know, resource and things like that, vice versa. So, so for example, we have a few custom made rows here. If you can see there's an RDS row. And if you remember right, when we, were, we created this RDS row, when we we're creating that RDS or uh, database. So each service that you create, if you create EC2, EC2, if EC2 has to perform certain uh, options or certain things on AWS, you need an EC2 role. If you wanted to create CloudWatch, if you wanted to create a CloudWatch logs from your EC2, you need a CloudWatch role. If you want to create basically any resource, you need a role for it to be able to create it. But now I'm the administrator, right? You are the administrator of your account. So you, you basically have the right role to do anything. So if you don't have a role, then you should have the member of one of these groups that have the right policies for you. So think about it. A role lets, as a resource, perform other resources. A role can let a user assume roles to perform other resources. But a role essentially is the permissions that you need to interact with any service on AWS. But as an administrator, you don't need a role because you have the ultimate role. You have the ultimate policies to do anything that you need. 
as a developer, if a developer wanted to access a database and he doesn't have the role to perform a database access, then we're gonna to have to create a database role and have that developer assume that role pretty much. So it's kind of like that. The roles sounds a little complicated, but trust me, it's not. You know, it's not, it's, it's an easy concept. So let me create a role real quick so you see how it works. So this is the open ID we were talking about the web activity, the one that you can give people temporary access, you see, Google, Facebook. So this is how you can let people log in with their Google, Facebook accounts to your account without having any, 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 any creating any accounts pretty much. So anyway, so for the role, you see you can create a role for an AWS account, or you can create a role for a service. So for example, I wanted to access, let me just choose any service, let me choose Lambda. Um, I choose Lambda, so next will be the permissions for that role, right? So now from the role, remember roles are also made out of policies. So I'm creating services for Lambda and I want this role to let me do anything I wanna do with my Lambda function. So if I give this role administrative access, what I'm saying is uh, this Lambda, this guy can perform any action on any resource pretty much. So you're saying that that Lambda can interact with any service on AWS. That's a very, you have to be careful with a role like this because Lambda can go in there and do all kinds of damage, right? Um, so these are the different, an administrator access to your Lambda function is bad. You know, you wanna be careful. So if let's say my Lambda function was meant to interact with EC2 instances, I can say, okay, Lambda, I'm going to give you the full EC2 access. And then I create that role. Once I create this role, I'll say the role for Lambda. Now, when I'm creating a Lambda function, they're gonna ask me for my role. And I'm going to say, okay, I, 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 this is a role for you. So let me just show you a quick example of how this role works. So now I have a role for Lambda, which is giving Lambda access to AWS EC2. So now I'll quickly go to Lambda functions. And I'm going to create a Lambda function real quick. Are you going to see where it's going to ask me for a role? I'll create a function. You know, my function name is Python. Um, I'm running a Python. So this is, I'm just showing you how you can use a role. You know, don't worry about, you know, whatever is happening here. And then for advanced settings, you know, permissions. You see, use a, create a role or use an existing role. So I'm going to use an existing role. And when you see, you see my role, that's my role for my Lambda. So this Lambda will be able to do anything it needs to do on the EC2 instances. So without this role, remember, without this role, this Lambda function is powerless. It cannot do anything. Any, any, any code that you run here is going to fail. Because why? The Lambda is going to have access denied, access denied, access denied. Does that make sense? So that's pretty much what roles are. So you do this for any service, even EC2, CloudWatch, they all need roles. So that's what the role does. So if you understand that concept of a role gives a resource, or even a person, if you want to assume a role, but it gives a resource access to other resources. That's what the role does. So keep that in mind. It's very, it's very important concept to just, you know, to understand a little bit. Any questions so far? Yeah, we talked about load balancers yesterday and I said, you know, today I was going to you know, just show a little bit of demo of what a load balancer, what it does to you. So um, essentially I'm going to go and show a quick review of what the load balancer looks like. But the load balancer exactly sounds like exactly what it is, guys. It, it balances loads between, it could be two containers, it could be 20 containers, it could be 20 EC2 instances, it could be two EC2 instances. Essentially, it could be an auto-scaling group. So load balancer essentially just manages load. And the, the classic way that load balancers work in EC2 is they use what we call a round robin. So round robin is essentially one custom, there's target groups, right? There's this rule, this listener is into this target. So a target group, guys, is just a combination of different systems. So it could be EC2 applications, it could be Docker images, it could be anything, right? That's what the target group is. And the target group could be made of any number of instances. So this is an example. You have walmart.com. Uh, walmart.com slash checkout will probably take you to checkout. Walmart.com 
slash. So let me let me open Walmart.com and, and try to show you this thing in concept. So we have Walmart.com. When I access this Walmart.com, it's going to hit a content um, a content management system we talked about yesterday, like like CloudFront. And that cloud phone is probably going to be sitting in front of a load balancer pretty much. So now when I hit Walmart, it's going to send me to one of those Walmart services, right? One, one of those Walmart services. But then if I hit, let's say if I hit account, or let's see, account or items, you know, let me just go on of these sub-departments. There's services here. Uh, let me go to the health service. I want you to keep keep in keep in mind to keep in mind with this, right? Walmart.com and see if it changes. You see, did you see that change? This is Walmart.com. And then if I click on any of these products, these Valentine products, you watch this change. This essentially is, 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 is what we call redirects, right? And these redirects could be target groups. I'm telling you these things from a conceptual standpoint. You know, this could be target groups. Let me give, let me try another, let me do another, let me go to another department. Let's go to the grocery department. Let me see, let me just go to electronics, um, shop or TV. You see that changes? So what you're seeing here is CP is going to be your, this your Walmart.com is going to be your main website. You have your first subdomain, or I wouldn't say subdomain, but your first redirect, your first part. And then your second part is going to be television and video. And then this number right here is going to be um, your identification and number. And this number is going to be what is going to be stored in your database to identify TVs pretty much. You get the idea? Yeah. So now what's happening is if I leave television and I go to a different department, you notice that this will most likely be the same, but this will change and this will change. I haven't tried that yet, but let's just try. Let's see, let's go to clothing. Did you notice that most of the, the stuff changed? So this yeah. is all redirects. This is all you see here, just redirects. And what I want, what, well, the point I'm trying to drive home here is, if you go to, man, my coworker sent me a message. This guy doesn't sleep, man. Anyway, so if you see here, I could you could have multiple different multiple, uh, microservices hosting different different parts of this, this website. Because clearly, what I'm telling you is clearly all of these are not running on one system. They're running on completely different systems that communicate with each other, and each one of these departments would likely be what we call a target group, right? Okay, let's go back to our diagram. So we have a target group here. This target group here could be targeting just electronics. This target group here could be targeting checkout, right? It could be anything. What the load balancer does is when someone comes and goes on walmart.com uh, and accesses it, this load balancer it would send you say, okay, should I send this guy to this walmart.com or should I send them to this walmart.com, right? Once he sends a customer to this walmart.com, if another customer comes, by round robin, he's going to send the next one here, the next one here. Oops. The next one here, the next one. So that's what the load balance is. See how he's managing the load, right? He's making sure that no one system is overloaded. That's pretty much all what the load balance does. <laughs> And then that obviously ties with, so let me go back to my, to my machine. So to save time, if we look here, we have two load balancers, but let's go to our target group. Let me, let me, to our EC2. Let me show you, let me differentiate. So the way I created this EC2 instances is I use the same way we did last class. And then I used um, this user data script that I showed you in class study. I'll show you real quick. Uh, where is our user data script that, that we used? So I created, um, if you remember from last class, if it was last class, you notice that we created an EC2 instance. And then I use this user data here. And what this user data does is, as you can see, it's gonna update your system and it's going to install 
the web server called Apache is going to enable that web server. I know Bajo, we create, we, we installed this today, remember? Yeah. But now we're just using a script. The script will do all of this. And then guess what it's going to do? It's going to echo hello world from, and then this is a function, a, a, a Linux function. If you type this on your local machine, it's going to tell you your host name. So it's going to send this to a file called HTML, index.html. And just for context, this file is a file that this web server reads from. So anything in this file is going to display to the web server pretty much. That's what it does. So we're going to see a lower one is going to give us a host name. So I have two applications that are already created using this user data. And I'm going to show you those right now. So we have two instances. We have this guy. If I go to the public DNS here, let's see what that one says. Let's see, we have, let's try this guy. All right, so let's look at the security groups and make sure that we have our HTTPD and everything open. Yeah, we have HTTPD and everything open. So now we can quickly go into that server and say, okay, what's happening? But I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna look at the user data and make sure that we're using the right user data for this service. So let's see this time. Yeah, so it looks like we have the right user that data for this service. So I think I know what the issue is. All right, let's try. But you see that we won't have the, this problem when we use when we use the load balancer. Can someone tell me what I'm doing here by removing the S? Security thing, right? It's the security measure. Yeah, so what I'm doing is by removing the S. I'm redirecting it from HTTPS to HTTP. So I'm redirecting it from port. Let's go back to that. To that, to that security group so you can see what I mean real quick. So this is your security group. So I'm redirecting it from, from here. This is the one with the S. And this guy with it is the one without the S. This is not secure. But in order for you to run this, you need something called uh, SSS certificate, right? To prove that you own that domain. That's essentially how you, you keep everything secure. I don't have that, but for load balancer, you notice that load balancer doesn't need that. It's going to bypass, but I want, just want you to remember this. Do you remember this? Remember that we have two systems and I'm just gonna keep this open. These systems have been created using that same user data. So what they're doing is they're echoing hello world from, and then they're giving whatever their host name is, right? That's exactly what they're doing. So you see here, hello world from, and then the host name. Hello world from the host name. So once we have that, now I want to show you how the load balancer works. So this is a load balancer, right? I'm going to create another load balancer just so you can see. We can do it from scratch. So I'm going to create an application load balancer uh, load balancer name testing, you know, HTTP, internet facing, IPv4, and VPC. I'm going to use the default VPC. And the, the most important part, guys, let me let me just look for one of those security groups that we already have that are been, that were open. Uh, let's see, launch wizard too. So we have our security group here. Uh, I want to use launch launch wizard too just because it's open to the public. Um, or I guess I could just use the phone. And then this is it. Remember, HTTP port 80. And uh, where are we, what are we forwarding to? This is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is a routing, right? You're saying that I want to forward HTTP. Uh, you're going to choose, you know, whatever, you know, HTTP system you want to forward to. So if we come back to our EC2 instances, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to forward this to, to, to one of to these two instances. So now what I need to do is I need to create a target group for these instances. So a target group is, you know, forgive me for keep moving back and forth, but you see, this is the target groups, you see? Yeah. I want to create a target group. So I want to create a group of similar instances that do the same thing. So I can share load between them. That's essentially what it is. And I'm going to choose instances. 
Um, attacking group is going to distribute test group. Uh, protocol, you know, HTTP one, health checks and stuff. And then I'll hit next. And then next is now, you see those two instances that I have automatically pop up, right? These two instances you see is these two instances, these ones. They automatically pop up. Oh, where is it? I'm going to quickly add them to my target group. I say, I want to target these two instances. And then I'll create that target group. So this is my target group, test target group. And now once the target group is created, now I'll come back here. And I want to refresh and I want to look for that target group. Hold on. There it is, this is my group. I'm going to use that target group. Remember this group I just created, target group. I created a target group. So what I'm telling the system essentially is, I want you to listen on port 80, which is the HTTP. And I want you to forward all the traffic um, essentially to this target group pretty much. You know, I can always add more listeners. You know, I can add a listener for, 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 for HTTPS, right? Uh, we don't have any HTTPS, but you know, I can just always add, add that, you know. So yeah, that would be for the 80, and I'll be retargeting it to HTTP. And I'll remove this, so. HTTP is port 80. So yeah, so let's create a look by and, and see what it says. Oh. So these are subnets. We're gonna talk a little bit about this later, what subnets are soon after, but I'm just trying to demo what uh, essentially. So I already have one of the similar thing like this running, but I just wanted to show you how to do it. So if you go back to my load balancers, This is one of my load balancers, right? If I access this domain, I want you to keep in mind something. Um, when I access that domain, where is it? That's my load balancer link. Oops. Yeah, I used, oh, I didn't copy the right thing. Where is it? So this is your load balancer DNS name. So this is what I need. I come here and I post it. Let me see, am I using the wrong load balancer? Where, where is this load balancer? Guys, it's so frustrating to move, to keep moving back and forth. Let me try, maybe it's this one. Let me copy that one. Let me try that one. Yeah, that's the one. So I want you to keep something in mind. This is my load balancer. So remember, this load balancer is sharing the load between these two instances here, remember? So what I'm expecting is when I contact this page, I want him to send me to this guy. When I contact you again, I want you to send me to another guy. So watch, watch how this, watch to see if this IP address here changes, right? Just to show you that is there is load balancing between two different systems. Do you see that? You see? Do you see how it's balancing the load? It's bouncing back between the two of them. It's bouncing me, yeah. So this would be what I'm doing essentially is what any customer would do. You log into a system, it sends you to the one of the instances to do what you need to do. And then when another customer comes, right, he sends them to another one. And then another customer comes, he sends them to another system. So now do you understand the concept now? Yeah. So it's bouncing between these two systems here that I have open. But this is a load balancer that just bounces between both of them, see? It just bouncing between systems. Bouncing between, if I added another system to the, to the group, it's going to keep bouncing between that one as well, between three. So that's what the load balancer actually does. That's the concept of load balancing. Just watch the video and it make a lot more sense. But yeah, this is a good concept just to keep in the back of your head. 
a very important concept. Why is load balancers all the time? So autoscaling group, we talked about this too yesterday. Autoscaling group will essentially be using load balancers, obviously, because you know the only way is going to be able to know which which system, which how many systems he has and how to divide load between them is using a load balancer. So the only difference between an autoscaling group, the biggest difference is an autoscaling group, you're creating a, a, a group of instances that you're telling them that I want you to change the size, right? I want you to increase the size, reduce the size, depending on the workload of my application. So if you're a DevOps engineer, now you have these instances, right? Let's say um, at night or during Xmas, or well, at certain times, let's just say during Christmas, you get a lot of traffic, right? A lot of people buying. You can schedule your auto scaling and say, okay, from the 25th to the end of the year, I want you to, to instead of having 10 instances, I want you to double it to 20 during those five days. And then after that, I want you to scale back to 10. That's what auto scaling will do to you. And then another instance is you can do your auto scaling based off of your CPU workload. So, What's happening is, I'm going to say, when I create my auto-scaling group, we're going to create something we call a launch configuration or a launch template. I'll show you that in a minute. In your launch template, you're going to put whatever you need to be in that instance, for example, the instant type, user data, and all that stuff. And then when you create your auto-scaling group, you're going to use that launch template. And what you're going to do is you're going to say, I want my minimum size. For example, you're going to, they're going to give you an option, your minimum size, five. Desired capacity, let's say six. Then your maximum size is 10. What you're saying is, at the worst, I want to have at least my minimum amount of servers running, which could be five. And then you're saying that if traffic, if CPU and traffic increase, I want you to be able to be increased that server, but I don't want you to get more than the maximum. So if your maximum is 10, if your system scales all the way to 10, it's going to stop there. You get the idea? So when you create auto scaling, you have your minimum size, which is what your system is always gonna. So if I have a minimum size of three, I'm always gonna have three instances running. Now, my maximum of 10 is telling me that whenever this load is increased, whenever there's too many customers on my website, I want you to scale up to maybe 10, that's the max. But if it scales, let's say to from three to four to five, and your system realizes, oh, now things are balanced now, it's going to stop at five. You get the idea? And then when customers start to leave your website, you're gonna scale down. So I can guarantee you that a website like walmart.com, they have huge auto scaling in the background. When you have so many people shopping on Black Friday, Walmart's going to automatically scale the servers in the back end. And then when Black Friday passes, it's going to scale down automatically. So that's what auto scaling does. So keep in mind, that's why it's a very important concept, you know, even though we're saying in class, once you go through the video, you know, also go in there and do a little bit practice because practice is always the most important thing. You know, and I can say stop all, all I want. I can show you the demo. I can even do it on screen and you see. But trust me, if you don't go back and do it yourself, you know, you're pretty much you know, wasting your time. You know, you have to go back and do it. That's how you, you put in your muscle memory. And that's how you put in your fingers. You see, most of these things, I just do them on the fly. Uh, it's because I you know I did a lot of hands on. It's not because I, I heard from anybody, it's because I actually practice them. So that's the key. The key is just doing practice. And practice, practice. When you get stuck, you learn more. When you get stuck, you learn more. When you get stuck, you learn more. Anyways, I have a quick question. Yeah. So what if you're working and you forget to balance your load properly? What happens? Well, you're going to have a lot of alerts coming like, oh, CPU is high. Oh, systems are gonna start failing and things like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very important feature. So when you go to the company, you know, you as a devil engineer, if you notice that there's time to have issues where, you know, today someone has to go and increase the system, the servers, or, you know, there's always gonna be high CPU and things like that. You wanna make sure, do you have auto scaling? You know, things like that. And if you have auto scaling, can we, Create auto scaling to base off of the CPU. Those are the things that you can recommend. And you say, man, this guy, this guy knows what he's doing. But yeah, anyway, let's see. Let me go to auto scaling. 
Um, for the scanning, you have to create something. Let me look at the time. It might be about time to break. Oh no, we, we have maybe a time and then we go for break. So when you're working with the scaling, you're gonna work with something called launch templates. I'll open that in a different folder, and then I'll open the scaling group different. So this is this is what the scaling group is. This is essentially what it is. So when you open it in your AWS, AWS will explain, explain it to you. You see. It's even telling you the same diagram that we looked at in the higher level. Scale out as needed, maximum, desired, and minimum. You know, so it is scaling, you know, it is a very important feature. It helps, you know, you can use it for instances, you can use it for containers. And in the case of containers, you're using something we call a uh, pod autoscaler. So we'll talk about that later. But there's so many things you have to cover, guys. That's why I keep recommending just practice, practice, practice. Practice everything will make sense because you're going to learn so many things as a DevOps. A DevOps. So before you create the auto-scaling group, you want to have something called a launch template. And as always, whenever you're looking for something, you can just search it here. In AWS has a very good index. I can search you anything. So I already have a group custom launch template here, but I'll just create another one real quick. So this launch template, how can I, how can I? How can I, you know, put give a good example of what the launch template is? Um, so let's say I wanted to go and buy um, some kind of a custom-made car. Um, I already know exactly what I want my car to have, right? So they're going to tell you customize your car. I want you to put the color, put the wheels, put the engine, and all that stuff. This is essentially what the launch template is. A launch template will essentially have all the characteristics that you want your your systems to have. Right. So, for example, let me first start by giving my name test template, um, a template version, you know, in a description, whatever description. But I'm not, it's always good to have descriptions for the sake of testing. I'm not going to put any description. Tags, tags are very important. Make sure you always put tags. And you can also source the template. So, when I was studying this, we didn't have this option. But to source a template essentially means that I can copy from another template and build on top of it, pretty much. I've never used that before, but I thought that was cool when I was going through the slides. And then for your launch template, it's going to ask you about AMIs. Baju, you remember um, AMIs? Anybody that was in the class yesterday? So when you go watch the video, you know exactly what AMIs, um, guys. But when you're creating a launch template, as an engineer, the best thing you want to do is you want to do you want to work with the custom AMI or with the AMI that you know. Uh, you know, once you have your custom AMI, you can install whatever you need to install into it, and then just use it as a long, large template. So, for example, yesterday um, when you watch the video, you see that we created an, an AMI based off of one of these images. So, if I wanted to create an AMI off of this image, I'll just come here, actions, image, and template, and then I'll create an image. And that's an AMI. So I'm just going to use the AMI I created yesterday. Um, resting my AMIs. There it is. There's the AMI I created yesterday. I'm just going to use that. And then instance type. So remember, if I choose T2 micro, I'm saying that every instance, every auto scaling group that gets created with this launch template is going to have this instant type. You get it now? So do I want my instant types to be this small? I don't know, but yeah, keep in mind that this is a template. So any auto scaling group that you create out of this template will have exactly what you put here. So it's a template, that's the story. It's then keep it. I know we did keep it. You need keep it to be able to access your instances in case there's, there's, a, there's a problem with it, right? Uh, you know, so network settings, you know, you wanna choose, you know, your different, you know, subnets to launch. We're gonna talk about those in the, in, after the break. Volume. You know, you add your volume, there's advanced settings, you know, you know, all this, you know, all this, you know, yeah, and there, you know. But yeah, I always go, you know, when you're learning, always go there. The base. So now when I create my launch template, you know, it's already been created. So I have two launch templates here. There's a test temp and there's a test template. So now I'm going to go back, remember to my auto scaling group. I'm going to say create auto scaling group. I'm going to give my name test group. And you see now it's asking me for that launch template, right? So I'm just going to pick that launch template and it's going to show my default values for my launch template. Remember my instant type, T2 micro, my AMI, this is AMI, ID and things like that. Security group, I didn't put any of that, but you want to put all of that in your template. And your template makes your life really easy. 
So you can reuse that template. You can have different templates with different systems. So think about it. As an engineer, I could have a long template for my web server. I could have a large template for my Redis queue. I could have a large, so you could have a large template for pretty much any system that you're running. So when you create a scaling group, you're just using different templates with different resources. Uh, VPC information, availability zone, I'm just going to add a few for my subnets. Network, default VPC. And that's just how you create an autoscaling group. Do you want a load balancer? Yes, obviously, you want us to attach a load balancer. And we've already seen what the load balancer does. So this is just manage the load between the, 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 the different instances that you run. Um, so yeah, so this is it, listeners and stuff like that. You know, ERBTTR. And then next, oh, we need to create a target group. Luckily, we already have target groups. And then let's see next. And now this is the most important part. So when I put desired capacity, if I put three here, notice, keep in mind, I'm going to put four here. When I put four here, as soon as I launch this auto-scaling group, it's going to automatically create four instances for me. Then my minimum, I'm saying that I don't want it to be below four. And then my maximum is going to be, I'm saying six, I'm eight. I'm saying eight is that if you're going to scale, I don't want to scale more past eight. So, so keep in mind, desired is always going to be what's going to be there. So now, um, remember, keep in mind there's notification, which is going to be our SNS. We're going to talk about SNS soon. And that's it. Let me go ahead and create launch my scaling group and see what happens. So yeah, I have my auto scaling group running. And if I go to my EC2 now, and I quickly load this EC2, what do you see? Do you see this is one? Already provisioning. Actually, there's actually already three already being provisioned as you speak. Because I remember previously, oh, this is a load balancer. We want to go to our EC2 instances. Oops. What do you see here? One, two, three, four, right? Oh, it's already it? launching four quick instances. You see that? Yeah. One, two, three, four. And guess what? If I had too many customers, the thing is, you know, this is what you can do on your free time, you want to test. You can create an auto-scaling group of two instances. And, you know, if you want to do that, I'll send you an application that you could run on your system. And it's going to increase your CPU. Once it increases your CPU, you're going to see how your auto-scaling group is going to scale up. Yeah, it's pretty cool. You know, I could do the demo and send you guys a private video if you want. And you see how I'm running it. But yeah, you quickly see four instances already running. Yep. That's how, that's how the scaling works. If, and then I'll show you another cool thing. I'm going to delete one of these instances. What do you think is going to happen if I delete one of these instances? Are you going to make a new one? Me? No, if you, if you delete one, is it going to make a new one itself? Automatically for you. That's how cool the scaling is, guys. Because you put minimum four, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now you get the point. Yeah. So if I delete one, it's going to create it automatically. If I delete it, it's going to create it. If I delete it, it's going to keep creating it. So that's just making sure that you always have system running. And that helps, you know. If your system freezes or it doesn't work, and you can just kill it. And then with the scaling, will just automatically create a fresh new one that works, right? So man, with the scaling, you know, I can't emphasize how cool it is, important it is. Everything I'm teaching in class, this is supposed to be AWS fundamentals, but I'm going in deep a little bit more. But you also have to go and understand how AWS works, play with it, you know. And this will be what I'm teaching you will be enough for us to do our DevOps. But as always, you want to broaden your knowledge, right? The more knowledge you have, the better for you. The more knowledge has always has never been a, a problem. So yeah, it looks like we have one already running. Mm. We have one running. Yeah, I want to, I'm kind of curious to see you know, what it displays from the load balancer. So let's just wait and see it. So now we can go for a break, guys. And it's still creating. When we come back, uh, we should be able to see. See what's running that with the scaling group. I don't know. Mm,
I'll see you in 10, 10 minutes, guys. Let's wrap this up and proceed. All right. Good. Oops, my bad. Let me share back your screen. I have to go to another one to come back.
हेलो यस सर ये आप सो आई आम आम तो आम तो थोड़े लॉस्ट सो आई वो हैव टू गो बैक एंड वाच फ्रॉम द अदर वीडियो Felix, no problem. Man. Make sure you watch other video, man. Yeah, that's why it's important to keep up. Yeah, to watch other video at least so, before uh, the next class. I, I want to ask something real quick. I want to understand something. So, from this um scaling that you just explained, so um uh, in the case where we have another instance created, let's say increases from four to five, uh, would it be correct for me to say it will be due to traffic? That yeah. Could... Yes. Okay. So if 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 there's a lot of traffic, it's automatically going to create another instance that is going to move you up to five or to six. Yeah. All right. I mean, there's less traffic. Yeah, Bajo. So like, yeah, so. It's going to keep scaling if if the if the load goes down, it's going to kill those instances until it's well is at your desired state. All right. Yes. So our, in this case, our desired state was four, right? So I had. I'm going to show a demo. Let's just keep proceeding. I'm waiting for the, for my uh, account to load. And then I'll queue one of the instances, and you see how it's going to automatically be created. I'll just kidding. But anyway, let's just proceed. We'll come back in a few minutes. So this is another um, important concept: CloudWatch. So everything that's going on in AWS, right? Everything from the EC2s to the S3 buckets to the Docker images, Kubernetes, is being monitored by what we call CloudWatch. So CloudWatch it monitors all the applications in AWS in real time. So if you wanted to see what was going on with a particular EC2 instance, you could quickly jump in there and look at the CloudWatch logs. You can go to CloudWatch itself, or you could just look directly. I'll show you how you could look directly in an instance. But one thing I want you to keep in mind is, uh, as good as CloudWatch is, most companies, if, if not all companies, they do not rely on CloudWatch. What, what I mean is they, will, they might use CloudWatch just for supporting evidence and things like that, but they all use different um, monitoring solutions. I know for this class, I just say we're going to do Prometheus and Grafana. So Prometheus will be monitoring our parts and then Grafana will be a visualization software. You know, most companies that use Docker images, you know, and things like that, they use Prometheus because it's free. Grafana is free. Other systems like my company, they use something we call Datadog for monitoring. And all the applications you get from Prometheus, all the, the, the alerts you can send them to Datadog. Some companies use what we call New Relic. Actually, one of my companies actually uses New Relic. So what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to drive home is, as important as CloudWatch is, any company you work for, they're going to have something else together with CloudWatch, you get it? That does essentially what CloudWatch does, but it's easier to, to, to move around with pretty much. It has a more UI design and things like that, but it doesn't take away from the fact that CloudWatch touches so many things in AWS. CloudWatch even has locks that it records. Uh, CloudWatch monitors CPU and all that stuff. So CloudWatch is still very important, but you know, as a company, you want something else that you can manage, something that you can streamline and all that stuff. You know, people that are built for it. So, you cannot compare a company like Amazon building a monitoring solution to a company like Datadog. That, that's all what they do, right? You, you know there's a difference. You know, you cannot compare a jack of all trade to someone that does one particular thing, right? So in this case, Amazon is not doesn't have the best monitoring software because it's other companies that are focused on that's what they do for a living, pretty much. So you know they're gonna do it better. But then on CloudWatch, you have custom metrics, alarms, and everything you need. We're going to open that real quick. But as a DevOps engineer, monitoring is your friend. You want to always be on top of the game. You want to know what's going on, 
right? With your EC2, you know, and all that stuff, you know, you want to always be on the loop to see what's going on, you know, know what's going on. So that being said, that's where CloudWatch, so as you can see, CloudWatch monitors everything you have. Um, you have your CloudWatch alarm, which you can set it up and say, okay, when if the CPU gets to 90%, I want you to send an email to me using what we call SNS, which we're going to talk about SNS right after this cloud watch. I want you to send me an email or if, if I alarm, and another thing that uses cloud watch is this auto scanning, right, Bajo? So now let's say we set our auto scanning and say when CPU is above, when the average CPU is above 90%, 80%, I want you to spin up another server. So auto scanning is going to constantly be, be talking with cloud watch alarm. Auto scanning is going to have an automatic alarm. As soon as your CPU gets to that level, it's going to alert the scaling, and the scaling is going to scale up. When your CPU goes down, CloudWatch is going to alert the scaling, and the scaling will scale down. You get the idea now? Yep. Yeah, so that's how they work together. Another instance, um, your EC2s that are running, all our machines are running, they all have locks in CloudWatch. Lambda functions, they all have locks in CloudWatch. So any application that you have running, I guarantee you there's custom, there's a matrix in CloudWatch, and you can create uh, multiple uh, metrics or so. With that being said, um, this is some important information. This is just good to know, but you know, if you're going to take uh, a certification in the future, especially the advanced, the professional certification, you know, they, they're going to ask you something around this, right? They're going to ask you a question, for the, for the professional certification, they're going to ask you a question like, um, Though an incident, so I want to see if anybody can answer this question. Just listen carefully. Right? I'm going to try and make it as short as possible. You know, I'm asking you. Um, there's a we just had an incident in our company, and that incident it did cause a breakdown in the system. You know, that's someone just explaining a scenario to you. You know, and you know, it's been three weeks since it happened. You know, can we go back and see if we can? look into the cloud watch logs uh, for the past three weeks and not just do that but can we see the exact um second or the exact minute that happened you know is that possible based on this chart to be able to see something a three weeks old um in in a one in a let's say in something like minutes as opposed to maybe five minutes or one hour is it possible to go to cloud watch and look at logs uh, that was three weeks old in a, in a, in a minute to minute basis. Yep. Well, close, but no, but look at this. All the minute to minute basis, they last a maximum of 15 days. All the seconds, data points between for seconds, you can see them within three hours. So essentially what he's saying is, if I want to look for the past three hours, I can be able to drill those locks into seconds. So remember, a, mon a matrix is just a time-based analysis of a certain scenario that happened at a particular time. So if you want, within three hours, you can even look as much as seconds. 15 days, you can see with minutes. If the lock is older than 63 days, you can only see them in five minute spans, time frames. And then if it's over 455 days, you can only see them in an hour span. So does that make sense? Yes. This is how they save money. And this is how they're able to aggregate. That's why you know every company, they're always going to have a different logging system. Because more logging systems are going to have this data available for even longer time. Now you can do them you know, by the minute, but yeah. So that's it. And I'll, before we look at CloudWatch, I just want to mention this concept real quick. Um, Amazon SNS is a subscriber system. I'll show you how to use that as well soon. We're going to create a, 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 a SNS topic. And then an SNS topic is basically an email subscription, right, Bajo? So oh, 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 think about it, Vitaly, how do I get alerted when something happens on my AWS account, right? It could be anything. You can even put an alert, I'll show you how to put an alert on your account to make sure that you know you don't spend too much money. So what you're doing, you're saying, oh, if my account uses more than $10, I want you to send an email to me and things like that. So an SNS topic is so important because now I can say that whenever the system auto scales, I want you to send me an email. 
whenever a microservice can communicate with users are using the SNS topics, right? You just have to subscribe to that topic. An event-driven serverless application. So let me explain you what an event-driven serverless application is. So me personally, I have one of my applications that I built that's running, it's with Python. It's an event-driven application. When I say event-driven, it means that it's been triggered by an event pretty much, right? It could be any event. But for my case, the event is when the CPU has been hanging for let's say 30 minutes. So if my systems, my microservices that we have running, the event-driven system, the way it works is, whenever the CPU goes above 90% for more than 30 minutes, right? That's an event. So it's going to use something we call an event bus, and it's going to send an SNS topic, right? And that SNS topic is going to send an email to me pretty much telling me that there's a system that has been hanging for over 30 minutes. And then you know what it does again? It sends me a notification, but at the same time, it's sending a trigger to my Lambda function, my application. And that application now goes in there, pulls out the system that's hanging, kills it, and recreates that system by itself without you touching it. So that's what we call event-driven. So it's basically being driven by an event. So you can think about any event. You can, you can even say that whenever I delete an EC2 instance, I want you to send me a notification. You can even say that whenever my EC2 instance is, has 90% CPU, I want you to, 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 to terminate it right away. So that's what an event is. So with this SNS subscriber system, it's so easy, guys. I'm saying it right now, it sounds like rocket science, but if you go in there, you can click, 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 and you'll be out of there real quick. So it's so easy. So everything in AWS is, they may try to make it as easy as they can. So this subscriber system, you see, this is the next topic. You can include them in what we call SQS queues. You don't have to worry about this, but you know, this might be something might just take a look a little bit. But these queues are basically like sidekicks, things that queue. For example, if I have 20,000 messages, right, coming into my system, you know, the application cannot consume all those 10,000 or 20,000 messages at once. So what do I do? I put it in a service called Amazon SQS. It just queues it pretty much, right? You know what a queue is of a line. Mm -hmm. So you just put in a queue and then whenever my system is ready, it comes and picks one. And now it comes and picks one and consumes just like that. So your system is not overloaded. That's what an SQS system is. So it's just important to understand the concepts. You know, when you watch the video, things like this, just write them down. Because those are things that, you know, you might come to a question and interview that things like this might help you answer. You know, you could, the subscriber system could be Lambda functions. Remember what I just explained to you? Uh, when something happens, it sends an uh, SNS topic, which triggers a Lambda function. And that Lambda function can do work for you. That's automation. HTTP endpoints. This is API. You can use an SNS to trigger a API endpoints. Amazon Kinesis data files. This is a, a streaming service where, you know, when you start studying AWS and doing like professional, you're going to learn about uh, Firehose. It's basically just a streaming service. It streams logs in real time, pretty much. Anyway, yeah, but that's, you don't have to know that right now. I've never used, I've worked with it doing training and learning, but I've never had to use it at my job, the Kinesis Data Firehose. So you might never have to use it, but you know, more information, like I said, is not bad. So this is an architecture. This is what you can do with SNS. You know, I like the visualizations because it makes things easier. So you can use NS, SNS, do you have your data firehose in stream. You can use it for SQS, Lambda function, HTTPS endpoint. And see, you can even use it for mobile texting, mobile push, email. Uh, and then you can trigger a Kinesis data firehose uh, that streams from something like that. And so let me let me say let me say this and guys if I'm saying if I'm I'm too difficult to understand, you know, just let me know. But you know, essentially what is happening here, this is a very important concept that you know the advanced AWS people you have to know. You know, you don't have to know it right now, but you know, to have it in the back of your head always helps. There's this is S3, which is starting our first class last on um, Tuesday. Redshift is, is a data warehouse, right? It's, it's a different from a database. Elasticsearch is just an indexing system. So when I say an index, when you go up to your phone and search a name and it pops, or you search a number, you go to your Gmail and you're looking for a particular email. Let's say you're looking for an email from, let's say a lawyer, and you type that lawyer's name and all the emails from that lawyer pops up. That's indexing. That's what indexing does. 
you know, so um, uh, Amazon Elasticsearch is an index. So all these, what happens is you can have locks stored in S3. It could be cloud tree locks. It could be any kind of locks. It could be just your regular files, right? You could have any Redshift, Elastic, or all this. And now what you can do is you can use the Kinesis Data Firehose, right? And stream all that information. So when I say stream, you've seen how, you know, when you look through a screen, when, when the movie is over, and you see all those people that acted the movie, they're coming up one after the other, right? That's basically what the streaming will look like. So you stream you everything that's not logs in real time using Amazon Data Firehose. And you could trigger that using an SNS. So SNS is very nice. You know, I use it a lot to trigger things. So that's why I had to mention it here. Uh, it's a messaging service. And let's go in there and do some work real quick. So the first thing I want to do is, you know, let's look at our EC2 or whatever our, let's look at our auto-scaling group. So we see we have six auto-scaling groups here. And what I want to do is, first of all, I'm just going to go and test that endpoint just to see if our systems are healthy. Let's see, where's the auto-scaling group? Uh, this is the auto-scaling group that we just created. What time is it? 7.49. This auto-scaling group we created. Um, so what you notice is you can see all the information that you need. This is your launch template. It's right here. Um, this is your load balancer. So this is what I want to open. And I want to make sure, you see, it tells me that my instances are healthy. There's four of them. So I'll go back to my load balancer. Where is it? Where's my load balancer? Go? This is another form of indexing, guys. When you're able to search here and then it pops up all this information, that's, that's an idea of what indexing is. Yeah, you, you can make your life really easy. So what do we have? We have this group. I think this is it. Let me try the DNS. My <clears throat> guy. I see, I see no be mobile. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I see, I see, I see, I see, you know. Uh, they pay. The good thing is, you know, once you, you put in the work and you know, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Nobody can take that away from you. For real. That's a fact, man. Like you see me now, you know, if, if, if I get fired today, you know, I just move on like nothing happened, you know? I just go and get another job in one or two weeks. <laughs> because I already know this stuff, you know? So that's, that's what you want to do. You want to know. And once you know it, nobody can take it away from me. No company can take it away from me. You know? So the knowledge, just get your knowledge. You know, you, you can always, you know, ask me the questions. I'm right here. So let's see where for the to open. So oh, anyway, the let's- questions, The questions are going to keep coming when we start finding jobs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the biggest, that's the biggest part. Right now, I just want you guys to understand the concepts, you know, and then we'll do some, obviously, as time goes, we'll do a little bit of practical as we're doing. And then when the job time, that's when we get the most. So let's do an example. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to kill one of these instances. Actually, I'm going to kill Terminator 2 of them. And let's see if auto-scaling is going to recreate it for us. So I terminated two instances. Okay, they terminated two. We'll go back and we'll go to our cloud watch. My idea is when I come back to this page in about a minute or two, we should have six more because now we have four, right? Mm -hmm. If I deleted the ones, oh, I deleted only one that belongs to the scale, you see? There's three more, so let me delete one more for the scale. So, the idea is when we come back, we should have five instances here. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, let me go back to CloudWatch. I'll come back to that page. I just don't want us to, to waste our time on one page. So I'll go to CloudWatch and we can look at CloudWatch a little bit. CloudWatch you just talked about. I'll duplicate that. And before we do CloudWatch, I want to show you what an SNS topic is. 
And when you go back, I want you to do this practice. It's so easy to work with SNS topics. So this is a messaging system we just talked about. So I'm going to go ahead and create a topic called DevOps. That's how easy it is. I'm creating a topic called DevOps. You know, you could do a first in first touch, but I'll just do the standard. That's my SNS. Well, I'm creating a, uh, a subscription service. And remember, once you create a subscription service, it stays. So you can use it for multiple different things. So now I have my topic that my SNS topic that I created. You know, you know, you can create encryption, you know, you can have different access policies, who can access that topic. You know, for the right now, I'm just gonna put on the topic owner. You know, you can see you have different options like delivery, retries, and all that stuff. But then I'm pretty confident that you know this topic, you know, we're gonna encapsulate everything I need. So yeah, so that's it. I created a topic. So what, what, what happens is once you create a topic, guys, now this topic now, messages can be pushed to this topic easily. But now how do I receive that topic, right? Uh, how do I receive those messages? I have to create a subscription. When you go and watch this video, you see it, you know, you know when you create a topic, when you finish creating that topic, you know, you click on that topic and you have to subscribe to that topic. When I subscribe to the topic, what I'm saying is anything that gets pushed to that topic, I want to receive it. You get the idea? Yeah. So any message that you send to that topic, if you're a subscriber, you receive it pretty much. So that's what I'm trying to do here. So I'm just going to do a normal email. I'm going to put this email right here. Linus, that my email for class. Linus, the center one at gmail.com. Yeah, line is a senior one at gmail.com. I remember it's going to ask me to go verify it. So I can have my filter policy. See, I can even say that if a message contains this and this, I want you to remove it and replace it with this. This is where you do it. I can say if my message has um, Vitali and Ramesh in it, I want you to replace Vitali and, and, and Ramesh with something else before you send it to me. This is where you do it. And then the dead letter queue is essentially with the dead letter queue, what happens is, you know, when, when, when there's no delivery, when you send a message and, they, and there's nobody, right, to receive that message, you know, should you create a dead letter queue? That is, dead letter queues, essentially, these are letters that are dead, pretty much. So it's, this is a list of um, messages that weren't, weren't um, delivered, pretty much. That's why the dead letter queue is. Uh, it could be important in some cases. So I created my subscription. So now what I have to do is I have to go to my email and I have to verify that subscription. You see that? Yeah, you just confirm it. That's it. Any message that gets sent to that email, this for that to that topic, you'll send to me. For example, I could do a a, a, a demo topic, a demo uh, message right now. Watch. I'll click on this and I'll publish a message. Uh, this is a subject testing. I'm just sending it to that topic. I could subscribe anybody in this class to that topic as well. If you all you have to do is send me an email. That's how easy it is. Hey, yeah, bro, testing SNS. I'm publishing a message to that topic. And I'll publish that message. The idea is that I have to see that message in my inbox. You see that? Yeah. That's how easy it is. Yeah. It's cool. So imagine this. This is what most people do. You can use this to have a bunch of subscribers. And this is how you can send email to all your subscribers. You get the idea? So it's yeah. all about creativity. If I have my business, Right, I could come create a topic in AWS, put all my customers in there, and each time I have a, a subscriber information, I just publish it here, and everybody receives it. I don't care if you're twenty thousand or thirty thousand people. Oh, so you don't have to be emailing them. Right? Yeah, one by one, you could just publish that message, and everybody receives it. Yeah, but now it's just one email, but you can put ten thousand. You see, you could create multiple subscriptions. Anyway, that's SNS. That's how, that's SNS, and then. Another thing about SNS that you should keep in mind is with these subscriptions, I want you to look at this. Did you, do you see these different services? Yeah. So if I choose Lambda, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put a particular Lambda function. I'm going to say that each time someone publishes a message to this SNS topic, I want you to trigger that Lambda function. You get it now? Yeah. Yep. And it's going to trigger the lambda function each time 
someone publishes a message here. So I can show you, if you're curious, I can show you how that works, but let's go to CloudWatch real quick. Since I already have a topic, let's go to CloudWatch and look at CloudWatch. So this is CloudWatch, it's not very fancy. And you see why companies prefer to have their own monitoring system. You know, it's not very fancy, but if you look at the dashboards, um, you can create your own custom dashboards, you know. Mm, I'm just gonna use line, mm, metrics. So now I just created a custom dashboard and now I can go in there and see I have SNS, four metrics, you know, and things like that. So you see the message I just got sent to my email, the DevOps, the, the message I just published. Mm -hmm. so you can track every message that you publish and every message that comes to that topic pretty much. So now I can go and say, okay, EC2. I want to see, you know, my instances per metrics, per metrics instance. So these are different instances. Uh, some of these are not specified. So this, so if I click, they have no name. You see the metrics. But you know, one thing you have to keep in mind is, you know, we've not been doing a lot to these systems, right? You see, this is when the instance check failed. So these are new instances. So you can obviously know there's not gonna be a lot of metrics um, for them just because you know, they're just new metrics. But imagine systems that have been running for weeks, months, for years. You know, you're going to have all kinds of metrics in here. And then let's see locks. There's also locks. We'll talk about that in a minute. So let's see, we have our dashboard. You know, we can add widgets to our dashboard. So I can say, okay, I wanna add a line graph to my dashboard and you know this one is going to be metrics. And I'm going to configure it. What do I want to add? I want to add the metrics about uh, my EC2. You know, I want to do it across all my instances. You know, I create my widget. Now, as you can see, you know, no, no, no action has happened. But if anything was supposed to happen to my system, you know, I would see it here, right? CPU will be in blue. Dig street. But unfortunately, or should I say fortunately, all the instances we have, they're brand new, nothing is happening on them. So that's why we don't have any data available here. So that's why. But if you go to a season system, like our company system, uh, you see all those logs. But like I mentioned, nobody here really uses CloudWatch seriously. So you only use it to, co to confirm. But any company you go to, they'll be using Prometheus Grafana, and they'll be using either Datadog, or they'll be using New Relic and things like that. So, but this will help you to be able to confirm things. So now let's talk about alarms. So when you open your alarm stage here, when you say, when something says it's in alarm, what it's telling you is that, 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 that metric or that condition that you put has been met. If it was high CPU, you see here, and then oh, this is where you see all your alarms. And then obviously this is your billing. So, well, I remember I was going to tell you something about billing. So this is where you come. So I'd like everybody to do this. It'll help you a lot. So I could create a billing here and say, okay, you know, I don't know the amount of services I have created on my account, but then I want to make sure that, you know, each time, you know, I have charges on my AWS account for a certain amount, you know, I want you to, 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 to alert me pretty much, right? So let's see, the, the, we're going with maximum. And then let's see estimated charges, matching name, estimated charges, currency, USD, threshold static, greater than, and then this is where you put it, right? Mm -hmm. So I can say each time my account uses more than $20, I want an email right away. And this is how you can try to monitor your account to make sure that you not have services running. For example, I've had services running for two days now, since my last class, three days now. It's costing me a lot of money. So now this is how I can create my alarm and guys, you can do it too, just go follow the video. Alarm, create alarm for billing. And I'll say next. And then I'll say in alarm, you know, I want you to send, remember the SNS topic we just created? Yeah. Yeah. I'll use that same SNS topic. Where is it? Okay, here it is, SNS. This is it, DevOps, right? Mm -hmm. So each time my account uses more than $20, it's going to send an email to me an email, say, okay, you're using more than this, right? How cool is that? And the idea is that you can use alarms for pretty much anything on AWS. So just keep that in mind. So that's, I'll create alarm right now. 
So it doesn't have insufficient data. So after a while, you know, you come here, you see when you collected enough data, it's going to start checking my account to see how much I'm using. Once I get to $20, bam, I'm going to receive an email right here. Say, my bro, you've used more than $20. Now I can go back and open my account and see what's costing all that money and then delete it, right? Yeah. So that's one of the things. So this is where you can create alarm. So like I said, you can create alarm for pretty much anything. You know, I can create an alarm for CPU, right? I can say, okay, whenever my CPU is a certain level, per instance metrics, I want CPU. You see that? CPU, I can create my alarm for CPU and say, okay, I want my CPU, each time my CPU utilization is above, um, I don't know, you know, I hate, I hate when they use these unit points, but I'm just gonna use 0.8, which is going to be, you see, it's going to be 80%. See that? Yeah. One will be 100%. So what I'm saying is, each time this particular instance, uses more than 80%, I want you to, to, to alert me. You see now how you can start solving problems? So now I can know exactly when that system is using too much CPU. So that's how, that's pretty much how you use CloudWatch. I mean, there's no rocket science to it. Um, let's see, that's alarms. And then logs is obviously going to be a log. So whenever you have logs coming to your system, you could use CloudWatch logs. But trust me, each company you go to, they're gonna have the different lock. So this is an example of a lock that you can stream. You see how the lock appears to you? That's the CPU utilization lock. So each time you wanna create a lock, you have to create these lock groups and then you have to dial your locks to your lock groups that you have here. So you create a lock group and then you can dial your locks to your lock group. Or any kind of locks, metrics, we already talked about the X-ray traces. Extra trace pretty much any application that you have. You don't have to worry too much about it. And then this is something that we had to talk about, um, guys. Remember when I was telling you that um, I have a system that when the CPU is up, it sends an event, and then the event triggers my SNS topic. You remember when I said that? This is what this does to you. Your rules and your event buses, they're the ones that are going to be doing things on your account based on events, right? So for example, I just created an alarm for my billing, right? For $20. You saw that? Yeah. Now I can come here to event breach or to event bosses and say, okay, I want to make sure that whenever my account goes to $20 or uses $20, whenever that happens, I want you to go into my system and I want you to delete whatever application that's using that money. That's an event, right? So that's how you can start connecting dots on AWS. And promise you guys, this is something you have to go, just read a little bit about it. You don't have to be super master of it in an interview, but when you have this idea that you can use an event bridge, you can use different things on AWS to trigger different events, right? Whenever you really have that idea in your head, you know, you can be able to define yourself in any interview. So we have our default event boss. So this is where you can create an event boss and you can, trigger events, you can make things happen based off of events. Um, let me go back to CloudWatch and see if I can do something real quick. Let's see events rules. So one thing I wanna mention is, before we used to have events here, uh, it was a separate rule, but now Amazon is slowly migrating it to what we call event bridge. So all the events that we used to use here um, is going directly to event bridge. So now it's a completely different application called event bridge that I just opened. So that's where you can put your rules and say, okay, when this happens, I want this to happen. Uh, in fact, let me open event bridge. Let me duplicate this and open event bridge. But essentially that's what event bridge does. It, it makes event things happen based off of events. So let me go back here. Uh, you can send events to different applications. You can create event bus. So remember when we created a notification in SNS and then we subscribe to it. The same idea here is you create an event bus and then you can, and then you can, you can send, you know, subscribe to it pretty much. So I have my event bus and then for my event bus, the action that I do is I can start discovery to, I can send events to it and things like that. And I can trigger events and send events and things like that. And this is my event bus. I have my event, event bus here. 
uh, test source and stuff like that. And then I could easily send this event to my event box. And any application that is attached to that event box is going to receive this event. Do you get the idea? So, I mean, it's, it's a little bit you know, overwhelming. Trust me, AWS is so big that even now, after all what I've talked about, I haven't even scratched 15% of AWS. It technically is just AWS for everything, right? I mean, they have all the services because they have their own terminals, right? They have all their own. Well, they don't have, they have their own servers. Yeah, obviously, yeah, there are those servers you can access terminals. So, so AWS, what I'm trying to make you understand, AWS is going to be the platform where all your applications are going to be running, right? Oh, gotcha. And everything is going to be running on. But then whatever tools you use to run those applications is going to be a whole other story. But yeah, but that's what event boss is. It does event, and then everything else, you know, is, so you have to just understand what CloudWatch is, what it does, alarms, dashboards, and everything. And another way you can see is, oh, this is our, so do you notice that we have our five? Yeah. So yeah, so Autoscaling has quickly created the two that we deleted. And then another way that you can quickly see CloudWatch logs is I can click on an instance here, and I just come here and say monitor, you see? Uh, you can quickly see, these are all from CloudWatch. I can quickly see the CPU. You see the CPU has been pretty steady. Uh, I can see the network coming in, network bytes, network packets coming in and out. I can see the disk write. Obviously, we're not gonna have any more disk writes here just because we're not doing any database intensive stuff. We're not storing any data and things like that. So we haven't stored any data on those instances. So we're not gonna see any disk write. Um, CPU usage, you see CPU was up. I bet you this is when it was creating that instance and then it dropped as soon as the initialization was done. So this is like a quick, and then you can also enable what we call detailed monitoring, uh, which you know once you enable detailed monitoring, it's gonna give you even more information than what you have. But remember it costs a little bit of, mom, a little bit of money to get detailed monitoring. This doesn't cost any money, but if you enable detailed monitoring, it's going to cost you a little bit of money. AWS is not that expensive. But yeah, when you watch this video, remember I want you to go and create an alarm for your amount that you use, just so you make sure that, you know, because I've had times where I've gone and slept and then all of a sudden AWS has charged my account like 70, like Ramesh, if you had this alarm, you wouldn't have been owing AWS $78. Yeah. <laughs> Why would I put it at $10 and then you get an email as soon as it costs $10 and then you just go and you know, yeah. stop it. <laughs> so yeah, so that's it for uh, auto scaling. Um, at, let me see, yeah, we can, you know, do you guys have the bandwidth to talk about a little bit more? Well, Class, is there more bandwidth or you guys are ready for a break? I don't want to overwhelm you guys with information. I know. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, we can quickly talk about VPC. Um, VPC is, is pretty important. It can be it can be complex, but you know I talk about it now, so you can have all week to to, to to do a little bit more research about it, and then after this we can be done. That cool. I'm not going to do too much practicals on VPC, but I think it's important that you know we get the concept of VPC. So we have approximately four more slides. So VPC guys, um, I, I would have loved to start with VPC when I started doing AWS, but it really would have done a disservice to the fact that it can be a little bit complicated if you don't know what AWS is. So it's good to understand what other resources are in AWS and then we can come back and talk about VPC like right now. So v VPC, as you can see, is a virtual environment for your resources, right? See, for example, um, we have, 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 you, have you ever asked yourself how um, we can have different companies using different AWS accounts, running applications, and then there's no way that those applications can communicate with each other. Uh, you can lose data. Have you ever asked yourself, you know, how that information can be so streamlined, be together, you know, people are not losing information, there's no leaking and stuff. Everything can be so separated when we are all using AWS. Have you ever asked yourself why? with that. So the answer to that is what we call VPC. So VPC is, a, is, is like an isolated virtual environment, right? 
It's like a data center, if you will. Um, so a data center will have your machines running that you can run applications on it. A VPC is just an environment in the cloud where you have resources that are running, similar resources running together, right? So for example, when you created your AWS account, a VPC was automatically created for you. It's called the default VPC. Uh, it's called the default VPC. So if I go to VPCs here, you'll notice when you create an account, I know you didn't know about this, you know, obviously, but you know, you just keep in mind, you see we have one VPC, right? You did not know anything about this, did you? But every application that we've been running, all the auto scaling groups, all the EC2 instances that we've been running, except S3, S3 doesn't run in VPCs, but all the EC2 instances, auto scaling group, everything we've been using so far, they've been running in this, VP, in this default VPC. So you get the idea what the VPC is. The VPC is a container of resources that communicate with each other pretty much. So what I'm saying is, if you create a different VPC, that VPC will not be able to communicate with resources in this VPC unless you do something we call VPC pairing, which is a completely different uh, idea in itself. But yeah, I'll repeat that again when you're watching the video. I want you to write this down when you get to this point. To make two VPCs communicate with each other, you need something we call VPC pairing. VPC pairing. You need VPC pairing. So when you get to this part of the video, just write that down and just Google it. It's easy. It's, it's a way you can have two VPCs acting like they're one, so they can share resources. Without that, a VPC, a one VPC cannot communicate to another VPC. So anyway, that being said, this is what the VPC looks like. A VPC spans multiple availability zones. I know we talked about availability zones in our first video. Um, uh, you make more sense, Felix, when you watch the first video, but essentially AWS is divided into regions. You have the US, Virginia region, Ohio, you have California, you have Mumbai, you have uh, a zone in South Africa, I think in Johannesburg, Joburg. You have one in, in Frankfurt and different other places in the world. Those regions, within them, they have something we call availability zones. So that's saying that if availability zone in Virginia, if availability zone, because Virginia has six availability zones, it's the biggest. If availability zone A goes down, B will most likely be up. If B goes down, C will most likely be up. So the availability zones, they're helping you, you have to spread your applications between A, B, and C. Same applications. Remember the auto scaling we just did? Remember that I, I, I choose six availability zones for my auto scaling group. Did you remember? It, it means that if I have four instances in my auto scaling group, automatically my auto scaling is going to put one here, one here, one here, and one in the other one, right? So if this guy goes down, I have to be more up. So I'm not losing money for customers. So auto scaling automatically do that. So a VPC, remember, a VPC spans the whole region of availability zones, but the VPC does not go across two regions. So you cannot have one VPC that spans Virginia and California, no. You can have a VPC in Virginia, or you can have a VPC in Ohio, but you can have a VPC in Ohio communicate to a VPC in Virginia. Just like I can have a VPC in Virginia communicate with the one in Frankfurt, but you remember you have to do what we call VPC pairing. VPC pairing, just keep that in mind. Anyway, this is our VPC. We have different availability zones, and this is our CDR. And the basic concepts of VPC is every VPC, I have a link here, guys. When you're doing the, the slides, you see this link, just more information. A VPC is made of subnets. Subnet is just a collection of, of IPs, pretty much a collection of sub IPs, if you will, that, that are contained in that VPC. So, what I mean is, uh, let me see if I can find a quick example. So a subnet is essentially a range of IP addresses in your VPC. So if I have, I know we did networking in Linux and I looked at that video and it looks like no one really cares about that video, which I mean, I don't blame you guys. I mean, networking can be kind of hard, but we talked about something called CDR. Remember, it was a bunch of IP blocks. 
So your VPC like this, let me go back. You see this right here, 10.0.0.0.16? That's a VPC CDR. With the subnet now, I can split this into maybe six. But then when I split this into six, I'm going to split this subnet, what you see here, into six different. So I could put 10.0.1 point, maybe 23 slash zero slash 32 and things like that. And you're dividing those into subnets. So you don't have to worry too much about that. When I started working as a, as a devil engineer, I, you know, I didn't know how to divide those into subnets and all that stuff, but that was fine. You have some nets, just is, is, is it when you divide your, your, your IP into smaller ranges, you divide them into what we call subnets. And then you have your CDR block, which is, you know, this, I, this right here, this is a CDR block, 10.0.0. You could be anything, remember? And then you have a route table. So essentially a route table uh, is basically a table of different routes to your system. So what I mean is, um, that's why I say VPC can be a little bit complex. That's why I didn't want to do it at first. But after this video, just go to this link. You can read a little bit and then you can ask me. But the route table essentially is a table that routes traffic to different parts of your system. So remember, we have our EC2 instance, our the scaling groups that are running. And then we have our, you know, our database. Uh, we could have our database. So for me, for my database to communicate with my, um, with my system, with my EC2 instances, it needs a route, a route. So a route table is going to contain those routes, which it could be a route to a private subnet, it could be a route to a public subnet, and all that stuff. And then you also know that, like I said, subnets, there's two kinds of subnets. There's a public subnet and there's a private subnet. And I'll talk about that and I'll talk about the difference. The difference is the public subnet, a public subnet has an internet gateway, a private subnet does not, because a private subnet does not have access to internet. So keep that in mind. A private, so the way you know a private and a public subnet is through what we call this HCP options. So these options, whenever you go, if you go back to your machine and try to create a VPC, or even try to create a VPC, you're going to reach a point where it's going to ask for this HCP, it's good, which is asking if you want a public IP assigned. So without public IP assigned, what you're essentially saying is I want that instance to have public internet, to have access to internet, that's GACP. Internet gateway is just is just regularly you see some visualizations in a minute, but internet gateway is just a guy that routes internet into our subnets so our applications can consume. It's this guy that brings internet. So remember, internet gateway routes internet. So there's internet gateway, and there's a route from your internet gateway to your subnets that brings traffic to your subnet. VPC endpoint NAT gateway. Uh, I think not, this not gateway should be in a different slide. So uh, that, 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 that's an issue with the slide. Let me fix that real quick. So not gateway is supposed to be a separate. So not gateway, if you have a private subnet and you want to provide internet to your private subnet, use a not gateway. So we'll see that in a minute. Security groups, I know we talked about this. Uh, is how you can put open and close ports on your EC2 instance. And then network ACRs, they're essentially security groups, but they're security groups on a subnet level. Security groups are on an EC2 level, network ACRs are on a subnet level, but you essentially do the same thing. You're controlling inbound and outbound rules. Yep, guys, a VPC, is a it, it can be complex. Even now, you know, as to get by, but you can still get by without knowing all, everything. But VPC is a complex topic. So totally don't blame yourself if you're having a hard time following up. Just go read the link, listen to the videos, and ask me any other questions you have. But yeah, it's, it's a topic, it's not, it's the hardest. For me, this is the hardest thing in AWS. Just keep that in mind. This is the hardest thing in the entire AWS. So if you can understand VPCs and the routing, that's all. Every other thing is easy for you to understand. So. This is a diagram that I just wanted to bring up. I know it looks complicated, but what I'm trying to show you is, you see your internet gateway that we talked about, right? It takes your internet and it directs it to your subnet. So this is your VPC, this is your AWS region right here. Maybe I should start using those annotations, Vitaly. Let's see, which one did you have, draw? Okay. 
So we have our region right here. I'm telling you draw. We are, this is our region. In our region, we have our VPC, which you can clearly see here. I don't have to really draw on it, but you see. We have our region, we have our VPC, and we have one subnet, two subnet, and three subnet. And if you notice, this is a private subnet. A private subnet, uh, uh, and to me, this is a public subnet. A public subnet, why? Because it has an internet gateway. And then if you have a company that is not in AWS, you can make sure they can connect to your subnet using what we call a VPN connection. Uh, using a virtual, virtual private gateway, VPN connection, you can be able to have customers from outside connect to your systems in the interior. So just keep that in mind, you know, that you can still have people from outside connect to your systems in the interior using a virtual private gateway. Internet gateway provides internet to your public subnet. And if you want that internet in your private subnet, um, you could attach an internet gateway to it. But the way people do it, and the way the engineers and the architects do it, is they'll use something called a NAT gateway. And the advantages of a NAT gateway is that your, your services here, they're going to be able to access internet, but the internet will not be able to access them. So they're safe in a way. They're able to access internet, at the same time they're safe. So anyway, let, let me go to some more diagrams that will help us. Let's talk about how the internet access is being shared. Um, so we have, this is our VPC with our NAT gateway. Um, so we have, so we have, as you notice here, we have our VPC, right? We have our, uh, our subnet here. We have our subnet. We have another subnet. This one is a private subnet. This one is a public subnet. You have uh, your, your, you can have your NAT gateway here, uh, which connects to this router. And this router connects to your internet gateway right here. So these guys, you see they can connect directly to the router, to the internet gateway. But then these guys will connect to a NAT gateway, that NAT gateway will connect them to a router that routes up to this internet gateway. So all the, all the systems here, they can access the internet, but the internet cannot access them. But here, all this internet, all the system here can access the internet, but the internet can also access them. So it makes it public. So this is an architecture. If you had an on-prem services outside, so you still have your subnets. Remember, your subnets are always living in your VPC. Subnets are always living in your VPC. And then your VPC houses your entire subnet. So this is our VPC 10.0.0.616. If you look at our subnets, you see our subnet is 10.0.1 slash 24 slash 24. This is basically coming, what you have to understand is this comes from this. Slash 16 is, has way more IPs than slash 24. Remember guys, if you don't understand, if you have issues with this, go back, watch a Linux video about networking a little bit. You can just watch the part about IP addresses. But essentially what your subnet does is it, it takes your VPC and it splits it into multiple versions, multiple IPs. So this VPC has this number of IPs. And then each subnet slash 24 will have a certain number of IP and slash 24 have a certain number of IPs. So you basically at least breaking down your VPC into different chunks pretty much. So trust me, you don't have to be rocket science in this when you're working with AWS. But it helps to practice. You know, I didn't understand fully what VPC was until I had my first job. But it, it doesn't help to try to understand because it's a good concept. You know, it took me a while to understand it. So I totally understand if you don't understand it right away. But I, had, I added the link here for you to read more right here. You know, read more. So right now, I think we're done with VPC. I think practicals is more important. So what I'll do is, first of all, we have our VPC here. What I want to show you all is we have this VPC and we have this CDI here, 1.72.31.0.0. All right, let's go to our subnets. And remember, these subnets are going to reside in this VPC, this default VPC. Uh, let's go to our subnets. How many subnets we have? We have six subnets. And you see the routing? It's last 20. And you see how many available IPs? 
So if you notice, every subnet is going to derive from the VPC. The VPC was, remember, this is just points I just wanted to keep in mind. You know, you don't have to understand, but I just want to see the pattern. The VPC is class 172.31.0.0. These two zeros here is where you start mix, mixing and matching. So this is where you, you divide your IP. This last, this last two octet, in the octet, this last two, and then this last 16. And if you keep this in mind that we have 172.31.0.0 slash 16, if you come to the subnets, you see that the subnets are divided from that. 1.72.31, now you have 64.020. Um, this is the guy that takes it from the base. You see this? This is exactly like what it is for the VPC. The only difference is slash 20. And slash 20, is you're saying that I want 490 IP. If I put slash 24, I'm going to have less IPs. You want to see that? Let me see if I can quickly edit this real quick. Let me see if I can edit some of the settings. Mm, yeah, IP. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't, I can't, I don't think you can change this on the fly. But if I would have put 24 here, I'll have less IPs available. But you know, that's just the idea of subnet. You know, that's just a basic idea. Remember, you know, read a little bit about route tables, read a little bit about NAT gateway and all that stuff, and then you'll be good to go. So let's create a VPC real quick. So I'm going to go ahead and create my own VPC, um, DevOps, you know, uh, I, IPv4, IPv4 range. So let's see. Let's see. Um, I put ten point zero point zero point zero slash twenty. Oops, what kind of zero is that? So remember, guys, this is not rocket science. If I wanted a lot more IPs, this is the maximum I can have. Slash sixteen. So slash sixteen is just a lot of IPs, guys. But anyway, I'll create my VPC for slash. Trust me, you can Google all of this online. It's not rocket science. You know, most of these uh, CDI ranges, I just Google the thing online and uh, there's even apps online that will help you break this into subnets. So don't, don't think you have to master this. So just keep that in mind. So I'll just create my VPC real quick. And now, now that my VPC is created, if I go back to VPCs, I'll see now that I have two VPCs. So I could launch applications now into this VPC and they'll be completely separated from this VPC. So let me go back to my subnets and create a subnet real quick. So I'm going to select the VPC, the default VPC, right? I'm going to say this is my subnet one, my subnet zero one. Uh, I'm going to choose, I want it to be US East one. This is very important because when I create other subnets, I want to put them in different availability zones. If I create another subnet, I'll put here, I'll create another one just like that to spread out my subnets for high availability. So now I can put 10, you see how, you see how predictable the pattern is? You could pretty much master this and say, each time I have a slash 16, my first subnet will be slash 24. And then as you can see from here, guys, I'm telling you, don't, don't look at this and be scared. I can just follow the same pattern here and say, I want all of them to be slash, slash 20, slash 20, and I'll use the same pattern. I'll say, okay, my first one will be zero, zero. My second one will be 48, zero. My third one will be 38, zero. My fourth one will be 16, zero. Guys, you can come here, copy the same patterns, and the only thing you change is 10.0.0.0. And then this will be the same, 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 this will be the same for different subnets. I you just change this to 10.0.0. So I'm telling you, it's not rocket science. Uh, once you get the pattern, I don't expect you to just pick it up because I've been doing this for a while. But all I'm saying is, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not complicated at all. You know, if you do, if you do a little bit of practice. So anyway, this is something that the first subnet I'm creating. I'm putting this class 24, and I'm going to go ahead and create my subnet. That's it. My subnet is created. I'll go back. Let me go back and create another subnet. So you see, I'm using that pattern. Devil VPC. Uh, my subnet too. Um, you see now instead of putting 10 slash 10.0.0. Now I have to put um, a different number. So from what I was mentioning, I could come here and say, okay, I've used slash 24 
80, well, how about I try something like, um, something like maybe 32, right? Let me try 32 and see if it lets me. I'll say, okay, I want slash. Mm -hmm. And let me try to create that. So, oh, it's telling me that it must be body CDR. So what I'm doing now is I'm trying to copy one, two, three, four, oh, there's five, oops. You need four. Let's see if it lets us. So you see, that's it. So now I have already have two thumbnails run for my new VPC, see? So now if I want to launch my application, I could launch one application here and another one here and they'll be in two completely different regions. So if a system goes down, I know I'm safe. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, just go back, watch the video, it makes more sense. Call me if you have any questions, guys. I think that's too much for today. So we'll come to the end of our class. Just go watch the video, stay this week, Felix. He's probably gone. Yeah, Felix is gone. Anyway, guys, I'm going to stop recording.